My goal is to give you as many tools as possible and then to help you know exactly what to do with them going forward so that you're not overwhelmed. Because we are going to talk about a lot, but we are going to avoid overwhelm because overwhelm is the enemy and we're only here to make friends. I just came up with that on the spot. That was good. <laughs> we're going to go to the leaf right now that says one lifetime order of non-toxic productivity, please and thanks because that is what we are here to do. I'm Kirsten. I'm a decision coach. Well, I've been a decision coach for over five years. Before that, I was a theater stage manager for over 10 years. What does that mean to you? It means I am obsessed with organizing and having zoom in and zoom out perspectives on situations. Things that I need to be good in both of these jobs that is not everyone's zone of genius. My life's work, my obsession, my passion, my whatever I geek out on all day long is What's going to make it the easiest for you to make your most powerful, authentic, self-honoring decisions? That is what you're here to get. You have shit to do. We're all about it. And you want proven effective tools that are usable by real humans. We're not talking about any highfalutin concepts that are not going to apply to you because like you don't have a plunge pool that you can just dip into every morning so that you can be your best self. If you do, please tell me and send a picture and congratulations. But if you don't, that's fine. Quick habit assessment, just so that we can get all on the same page about this whole toxic productivity thing. I love being productive. Let me be clear. I love a color-coded spreadsheet. I love an organized calendar. I love a project to manage. That's why I spent so much time doing that in theater. And what I've done in decision coaching is essentially help do that for people's thoughts and feelings. Because this toxic productivity that we have become accustomed to is no longer something I want to buy into. And usually the people that come into my orbit, don't want to buy into it either. So if you've been in these places where you're like, feel like you're running a race and your job is to get as much done as fast as possible, or you feel like you're underwater and you're freaking drowning because you have an unmanageable amount of things to do, or there aren't enough limbs that you have to do all of the things and keep all of the spinning plates in the air, or you feel like you are under constant pressure. A lot of my clients struggle with needing pressure to, and a couple of my clients are on here today. So hello, you know what I'm talking about? Needing pressure to get things done, but for that to feel terrible. Like you can, you might be very effective at using pressure and and stress to complete things, but that not be, might, might not be a sustainable way that we want to be productive for the rest of time, right? We don't want to feel like everything that we want and feeling better and being able to relax is always out of reach. I'm going to share... One of my clients stories really quickly, just so that you know, this is possible. This is Arielle. She said before coaching, she was this unaligned, high functioning human. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. She was running this really big, like LA's biggest farmer's market. She had two tiny kids. Like she was a functioning person, but she was not aligned and it was draining her energy. And she was operating on this place of you've got to do and a task list and a routine through coaching. She knew that that's not what she, how she wanted to live and make decisions the rest of her life. And she's moving from this deeply aligned place now, as she describes it. She said she's eliminated a lot of the unnecessary noise like raise your hand if that sounds familiar. So she can hear herself clearly and loudly. And it's easy for her to make decisions because the next best thing is just more obvious. I want to share her story with you because this sounds sometimes too good to be true, especially if we're like in a very far away from it place, but it's possible. And I have to tell you, while we were working together, she quit her job that was not aligned. She started an online business that she grew for, I think over the past year and a half, two years. She started in the pandemic, so it's been two years. And right now, it's so much fun. And if you live in LA, you have to go visit her store. She is in construction for her retail space in Highland Park. She's opening a neighborhood grocery store that she's building out of her online business. And she's created this entirely different reality for herself because she knew she wasn't aligned and she wanted to make decisions differently. So massive success story. I'm in LA and I cannot wait to check it out. Oh, Carla, first of all, I don't think I knew that you were in LA, did I? Second, oh, yes, I'll find you on Instagram and connect you guys. Let's get into the solutions. Ooh. This is the grid that is going to be the framework for our conversation today. The clarity efficiency grid. I just want you to locate yourself on the grid right now. This is where we're going to look at specific situations and specific solutions for specific problems. The biggest the issue I see, or one of the biggest issues I see with people struggling to get shit done in the way they want, at the pace they want, 
is they though all of the problems pile on top of each other at once, which is very un- overwhelming and unsolvable. And what I want to do today is help you organize your problem piles, neutralize them, like it's not a problem to have a problem kind of thing, and look at how they're solvable individually. It's not going to be the most satisfying wave a magic wand solution. Everything is different, but it is going to give you so much more satisfaction because you are going to implement these changes today, take on one thing at a time and make things happen so much faster. So this is the sweet spot, of course, right? Like if we're in the sweet spot quadrant, we are, we know what we're doing. Things are moving efficiently. We feel great. (laughs) we dip in and out of the sweet spot, but by no means are we ever expected to live there and stay there forever. Okay. So please like get, let's all get on board with that. Then we have these different quadrants that we're going to go into individually today. And I'm curious if any of this sounds like where you are, there's the clear, but inefficient quadrant. I know what I'm doing. It's not happening exactly the way I want or the best way I know it could. There's the efficient, but unclear quadrant. Like I'm good at getting stuff done. I just like don't have a prioritization system or don't know what I'm on or what to do first. And then there's this like tends to be scarier quadrant, but I promise don't panic. It's full of solvable problems in the area of I'm not as clear as I want. I'm not as efficient as I want. So just before we go into these different palm leaves, drop a number. Where are you right now? I mean, if you feel like I'm in all of these quadrants multiple times a day, that's fine. Put all the numbers, but I'm just curious. Do we know where we are? Do we have a sense of, I'm pretty clear, but I want to be more efficient. I want to be more clear. And that's like my biggest issue right now. Or like, "Mm, I'm in the panic, don't panic zone. Mostly resonate with clear, but inefficient. Definitely move around. Yeah, I think we all move around. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Okay. We got a one in there. Great, Elizabeth. Moving from four to two lately. Okay. So we have some efficiency to focus on. Carla, great. The busier it gets, the more I slide into four. Okay. So, right, Kimberly, that's like there's some organization to be had so that we can get you clearer. And there's some efficiency to organize too. Not all the time in one. I know. Nobody's all the time in one. I think that this is very normal. Four is the quadrant. Sorry, I didn't define that that adequately. Four is the quadrant where we're not clear and we're not efficient. We feel like this is sometimes clients describe this as like, I feel a drift in the ocean. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I want to go. And I'm not getting anywhere anytime soon. Sometimes it feels like deer in headlights. Like I'm so stuck option paralysis and... So nothing's getting done, but I don't even know how to know what to do first or what I want to do first. Living in three, wallowing in four. Uh, You know, my background is in theater. So like all of the dramatics that we want today, totally welcome. We're not going to be mad at that. Okay. Living in three, wallowing in four, Laura, efficient, but unclear. Okay. That sounds absolutely spot on for you. Solvable. Great. In the midst of packing and moving, I definitely feel like I'm stuck in four. Okay, great. So as we move through these quadrants, you'll probably see a lot of issues, solvable problems, growth areas that feel like you've experienced them or you are right now. So what I want you to do is just pay attention to what do I need to hear today? You're going to get this replay. You can always come back to hear something that you need to hear again. So today, give yourself permission to just hear what you need to hear today, because there's going to be a lot of options. And like I said, I I can help you figure out where do I want to focus first. So let's head in to quadrant two, clear and inefficient. A lot of the problems that land us in the clear and inefficient quadrant have to do with to-do drama. So here are my suggestions, your options to solve this problem. The personal org chart, we can't underestimate, we can't overstate the value of putting things down on paper. And the reason I suggest this kind of personal org chart, like map 
of all of the projects that you have ongoing or all of the areas of responsibility, everywhere your resources are going. The reason I suggest that is because your brain is designed to process information in pictures. That's the fastest way it can process. And when you're trying to take on all of your life's goals and challenges conceptually in your mind, and maybe you have little like sticky notes in your mind of lists of things to do, and your brain goes into logistics, and then your brain goes into like problems and what is everyone going to think about this and how impossible is everything. You're making it harder. You're creating friction in your data processing. So a great first step, especially if you're in an overwhelmed place with your to-dos, is to get it on paper. And what I mean is just literally putting on, like getting a physical piece of paper and writing down like what's on your mind. Just that alone can help you feel a sense of empowerment and ownership and agency over everything that you have to do. And it can reveal a starting point. What's the biggest problem area? Or what do I need to focus on first? A lot of what we're doing today is focusing on your decision-making around what problem is the most valuable problem to solve first. And I say problem a lot, but that's because I've adopted this mindset about problems as though it's not a problem to have a problem. I think I said that before. There's some quote that I can't find the origin originator of, but a solvable problem is not a problem. An unsolvable problem, that's just what is. That's neutral. That's just reality, right? We're not trying to solve the problem of gravity. There's no solution. I mean, I guess you can go into space, but you see what I'm saying? So take or leave that, uh, that mindset, but we're going to be talking about problems and I don't want that to be a trigger word. So I don't think it's a problem for us to have problems to solve. So the personal org chart is the first option for solving the to-do to drama. The next three bullet points are very connected. So a lot of what we land, what lands us in this quadrant is that, like, remember that picture of that chick underwater, this feeling of, I have too much to do and I have not enough time. My invitation for you is to release that thought for the rest of time. Release the thought that you don't have enough time. Decide that's not true. Decide that's not your situation. We've been conditioned and we've all bought into this idea that it's very normal to feel like we have more to do than we have time to do it. If you step back and look objectively at us as humans, if we were scientists observing ourselves and we said, okay, this is what they do all day, it would be bananas for us to observe all of these humans walking around being like, well, I have to do these things I can't do. So now I'm stressed and frustrated. And I don't say that to invalidate any stress because I know it's so normal and so human to feel like you have more to do than you have time to do it. But my invitation to you is to make a decision. Remember, we're focusing on decision-making that's going to make it easier for you to get shut, shit done. And this is a decision available to you. You can decide right here today, I have enough time. I have as much time as I need to do the stuff that I need to do. And it's actually impossible for me to need to do more than I have time for. I did do a TikTok about this, like putting pasta in a pot. My husband insists that you cook spaghetti like the authentic Italian way where you cook the whole spaghetti strand. I don't like washing heavy pots. I don't like filling big giant pots full of water. They're heavy. They take longer to boil. I just can't be bothered with it. So I always break the spaghetti in half and he's very offended by that. But this is the analogy I use with clients often. This idea that we are regurgitating to ourselves, I don't have enough time. I have to do things that I don't have time to do. It's like you're standing in front of a tiny little soft spot with a big ass pile of pasta that doesn't fit in it. And you're saying, I have to fit this pasta in this pot. And it's just not going to get you anywhere. It's certainly not going to get you any dinner. So what are our options? Break the pasta, get a different pot, order takeout, right? Let's all collectively agree that we're not going to buy into this mindset anymore. Ditch the catch up, right? This is like the feeling that I have to get caught up. And I think a couple of you noted this in your emails to me in the prep emails. I just feel like I need to get caught up. And I work with a lot of people on this a lot of the time. So I'm validating the crap out of it. And it's a really stressful place to live. And I think we're on to ourselves at some point that we think the solution to that stress is catching up. And we know in our hearts, 
this is a paradigm shift I need. I need to decide that I'm not underwater. And a lot of what we're doing today is logistics. It's going to help you organize some stuff and get more done. But this is a lot of mindset stuff, right? It's also about setting kind expectations. If you decide I have enough time to do it what I need, you no longer put yourself in the position of the failure who should be able to do more, but you can't. A lot of my clients make this shift and they find it really helpful to go from realistic self-expectations to kind self-expectations. If you have to do everything that is expected of you, is demanded from you, blah, 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 then where's your agency, right? And embrace the language of trade-offs. This is something to give you authority over your to-do list. If you're going to do something and decide it's important enough to do, it might displace something else. And we don't want you to feel like you're a failure because you can't fit both into the same time space continuum. So embracing the language of trade-offs can be very empowering. Deciding, okay, this is my conscious choice to do this. And what I'm willing to trade for it is this. And that can mean put doing this later, delegating this, not doing it at all. There, there's wiggle room with trade-offs. The final thing to address the to-do drama is delegation is learned. Everyone I've ever talked to who doesn't think they're good at delegation, encourage you to adjust the way that you're talking about that as if you were talking about scuba diving or something that you've never done. If you're not good at delegation, it's just the same thing as if you're not good at scuba diving. You haven't practiced it. You're not adept at it. And if you really wanted to get good at it, you could. So I don't want you to think of this as an identity thing. It's a big issue that I see people like creating friction Decide that delegation is a learned skill, not an innate trait. And if you need to get good at it, you can, and you can start off not great at it, and you can get better. These are all decisions available to you. Okay, distracted tech. This is the inefficiency that comes from fires everywhere. Fires come up and they distract you from what you meant to do, what you wanted to do, these long-term things that you're never getting to etc. Like raise your hand if you've ever been in that situation. I'm kidding. We've all been there. So what I want you to do is adopt the mentality of the fire drill. If you are in a period of life or in a job or in a moment of your family life where you have tiny little kids or something, something is creating reasonable expectations that fires will come up. I want you to put that into your plan. A big problem I see with people not getting to things or feeling like their time is stolen from them by things that come up. This was like the beginning of air quotes that I didn't finish. So they were just became T-Rex hands. The biggest, the one of the big problems I see is people are not planning on the fires. So if you are in a situation where there's a reasonable expectation that stuff is going to come up, put it in the plan, run a fire drill. This is where you train your brain to expect, okay, something's going to happen. I may not like it. I may not be able to plan for it. And I may not be able to pre-solve it, but it, I don't have to experience it as a problem, as if something is going wrong, not according to plan when this thing comes up. Does that make sense? It's like walking into a room of toddlers that you're going to be in charge of for three hours and being like, well, someone's going to get hurt. Let's just expect that so that when they do get hurt, we don't freak out and think, oh my gosh, something's gone wrong. Now I can't do what I was supposed to do here. You just solve the problem. You address the boo-boo, right? I also want to suggest that you adopt the original definition of priority. Priority was a singular noun for like 400 years. And then sometime along our history, when we got the industrial revolution, everybody started doing things with machines and we pluralized it. We decided, you know what would be like really fantastic and make our lives easier if we had more than one priority at once. If more than one thing was the most important thing all at the same time. Again, this is one of those things, if you step back objectively and look at it, bananas. And it's where a lot of our issues with thinking we have competing priorities comes from. So again, this is a decision available to you to make. And it makes a big difference in a lot of clients' real life daily working. Adopting this mindset about priorities that one thing is allowed to be most important at a time, period. And you shift in and out of what's most important based on where you give your time and attention. 
But this also allows for multiple goals and multiple values to coexist at the same time in your life because you're not putting the pressure on yourself to do all of them all at once. Final suggestion, if you're in the distract attack situation, commitment plus imperfection equals winning. A lot of us on here have already noted our perfectionist tendencies are creating inefficiency. And this is something we talk about a lot in coaching the decision available to you to decide how perfect does this thing need to be. And a lot of my responses to people's prep questions with what do you want and what's getting in the way involved asking about timeframes. And that's going to come up in the next bullet point. But if you're committed to something and you know when you want to start it by, when you want to finish it by, you know you don't want to get five years down the line and not have gotten to it, then you can commit to whatever time frame is available to you. And then I want you to know you're allowed to decide how perfect does this need to be. You're allowed to go for A plus perfection. All of us here are capable from that. I don't work with underachievers. So it's just, they're just not my people. And if part of your brain is saying, I'm an underachiever, that's just you being super duper hard on yourself because you're an A plus plus student and you've probably been doing like B plus to A minus work lately and you're being really hard on yourself. So I want you to know you can embrace the opportunity to make the decision about how perfect does anything need to be. And when I work with clients on this, I suggest they start really small. One of my clients recently was like, I have to write this email, but I, it's just been taking me so long to even start it because I know it's going to take me a long time to write it. So we use that as a perfect opportunity to embrace, like how perfect do you want it to be? How much time do you want to spend on it? And she consciously decided, okay, it's not really important that I spend six hours of my life on this four sentence email. Look for areas that you can exercise this decision making about how perfect or imperfect am I going for A plus? Am I going for D plus? And let's like neutralize. Yeah, D plus is fine for a lot of stuff we do in our lives. It's great. We can feel great about that. Okay, clutter and calendar. The clutter anxiety is real. Our environment affects us deeply. Some people more than others, but it affects us, period, as humans. So this is something that a lot of clients kind of want to skip over because they think like, this shouldn't be a big deal. I should be able to deal with it. People have bigger problems. So I want to give you permission to make space for your environment to be a problem worth solving. Is it the most valuable problem to solve first? Only you can know that. But is it a valuable problem to solve in general? Absolutely. So do a scan because a lot of our inefficiency is coming from like silly feeling logistical crap that we just don't make time for. We don't make time to make our systems easier or our stuff more accessible or our room prettier. I'm like pointing at all my palm tree curtains and all the things that I have like palm tree themed in my office, because that's what makes me happy and it makes me efficient. So let's make some space for this. And do you potentially have to carve out an hour to make this the priority, the function and feel of your environment? What inefficiency is being created by the function or feel of your environment? Start and deadlines. We talked about this a little bit already. Timeframes are very effective. And a lot of my clients are hard on themselves because they think I can't function without a deadline. I can't get things done. I'm such a procrastinator. And a a lot of the time, like at least half the time, they're just being normal humans who thrive on deadlines. Deadlines are very activating. If you've never heard of Parkinson's law, it's the law that states that work will expand to fill the time it's given. So why haven't we done the thing that we have been wanting to do for 10 years, but never had a deadline for? Because there's no deadline. That doesn't have to be a personal character flaw and identity failing on our part. It actually just means like, okay, things are working as they're supposed to work. Deadlines are helpful. Great. Good to know. Let's put some timeframes around things. So when you do your personal org chart, you can use that to kind of get into deeper and deeper into what are the goals? What are the projects that you are taking on and start assigning some time frames to things. And start lines are as helpful as deadlines because a lot of people resist putting deadlines on things because it feels arbitrary. It feels forced. It feels like, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know how long this is going to take. That's fine. Make a start line and the deadline will reveal itself. Okay. Two more things. Deadlines whoosh past me. Yeah. Okay. So that's a growth area then, Tammy. That just means like, do we want to change what we're thinking or what we're doing? 
Like, do we want to change the way we're thinking about deadlines and think maybe it's not a problem that they whoosh past me because they help me get things done and neutralize the fact that like they come and go and you just move them? Or do we want to change what we're doing? Do we want to set deadlines differently or do we want to do things differently so that we meet the deadlines? A lot of this is about the decision available to you to decide this is a solvable problem. And just because I'm saying it with a smile on my face doesn't mean I need to imply this is, should be easy and you should be done by now solving this problem. But it is solvable. And that's what we got to know. The analogy I always use for my clients is we're not going to spend our lives climbing mountains that we've decided are impossible to climb. That's just not what we're here to do. We're not going to like get all this gear and bother to drive all this way to park at this mountain and start climbing up it with the mindset that this cannot be climbed. How much harder are we going to make that climb? Today's top three. This is the post-it that I use and send to all my clients. It says today's top three on it. It's noted by post-it. You can get it at Staples for like $5. The concept of the top three is what we're getting at here. A lot of you have a lot on your plate, a lot on your list. And a lot of inefficiency that I see is coming from people unable to identify any kind of hierarchy in their to-dos. So what I suggest is trying to identify the top one to three things that you have to do in a day, even though I know you're going to do like 16 to 1000 things today. If you take the time, it does not have to be a lot of time to identify what are the most important things and you limit it at three, which is a struggle, but I promise you can do it. You can get good at it. My, one of my clients surprised the pants off herself when she like really, she walked around with physical papers for so long in her life. And then she just adopted this practice of deciding what, what are the most important things? It's so empowering and clarifying. And it doesn't mean you're not going to do more. It just gives you a sense of authority over your time. And when it comes to fires coming up and making trade-offs, you have more of a sense of what you're working with. So if you've decided these are the top three things, you might have to practice at actually doing those things. A lot of people are harming themselves because they're like, I say what the top three things are and then I do 19 other different things. That's fine. That's just habit change. <laughs> but you're normal if that's what happens. But yeah, it, it's, it's so normal, Tammy. But once you can get good at that, it also will put you in a position of power to like, be the puppet master of your time and your to-dos so that when a fire comes up and you're like, okay, I choose to, to put this fire out. Here's what I want to trade off for it. You know where you stand. So you don't get to the end of your day and be like, I didn't actually do the things that I needed to do today. Cause that's a terrible feeling. The final thing I want to say is, is there blank space in your calendar? This also relates to the fire situation, because if you are filling your day. If you're maxing out your time and your energy, which is an important one, because a lot of us have way more time than we have bandwidth and like physical, energetic, mental capacity. So if you're maxing yourself out, are you leaving any room for changes, surprises, interruptions, fires? And are you leaving any room for freedom, for creativity, for inspiration? A lot of the inefficiency stuff that's getting us in this quadrant comes from us seeing our like big long-term to-dos and we're not make, getting traction on them. And it's because there's no blank space in our daily lives for the long-term stuff. We're doing our daily lives and we're like keeping ourselves afloat with it, but there's no blank space to like play with ideas about what we want to do in the future or engage in fun stuff that we're like experimenting with that we haven't turned into an official goal yet. So again, this is a growth area. This is a learned skill. Blank space is not just going to show up on your calendar. So it's not your fault if this isn't happening. And it's not like you're doing anything wrong. It's just like delegation. If you're not good at it, you can start small. You can start on a weekend. You can start it, it, in a, with a 15 minute increment. So see what's doable. And then you can grow from there. Let me tell you about Riley, first of all, because I really love giving really real life examples of how all of this stuff that can feel like conceptual and do I know how to do this or not can be translated into real human 
people's lives. Riley shared that with coaching, she dialed in small practices like a daily check-in. I send everyone I work with this huge decision master's workbook. It's only huge because half of it is a journal. It has a daily check set in it. And Riley started doing this. It helped her get a sense of clarity to every single day. And it was not a long process. Like my brain can't answer 16 questions every morning. So that's not how I designed this journal. So over time that added up to her making these huge life changes, like starting her own business and changing her career, but it started small. That's what I want you to really know is okay. This, this is what I meant when I said, it's probably not going to feel instant gratification because it's not going to be the big solution to all things. The daily changes give you marginal gains. Efficient, but unclear. Okay, let's give you some doable solutions, some decision-making tactics to get out of this quadrant and hanging out here for less time. If you're in option overwhelm, I want you to smallify the next step. This is where the personal org chart can be helpful as a starting place. And then we got to get super granular. Because when you are taking on big projects, whether they're big, daunting, big, super meaningful, or both, it's easy to feel like you've given yourself an impossible to do. And a project is not a to do. A task is to do. So what's the next task, right? The way I talk about this in my coaching is the uh, the MVTs. What are the most valuable things to do? What are the most valuable tasks today? Tasks can sometimes, like people don't like that word. So valuable things, valuable tasks, whatever. But really allow yourself to focus on the next doable step. Even if you just do that to answer the questions, which is the next bullet point, you'll start, you'll kill that inertia that's been built up and start getting yourself into action. Something that's happening in this quadrant is we're trying to think our way into clarity. And thinking can only get us so far. Action can get us farther faster. So I want you to really give yourself permission to adopt this mantra of mine, if you will. If it were easy, it'd be easy. If you're not clear and you've been asking yourself the same freaking question for 10 days, 10 months, 10 years, and you're not answering it, it's you're not able to come up with a clear, concise, trustworthy answer. It's like not a high quality question. We need, that's what HQQ stands for, high quality questions. You have total permission to stop asking questions that are not answerable. You have full permission to start asking high quality questions that are answerable because those are the ones that are going to get you into action. And usually the highest quality questions are smaller. So as opposed to what new career do I want? If that's not answerable, ask a smaller question. It's not going to be as satisfying, but it's going to be way more answerable, which will be satisfying. And I also want to introduce this idea of stagnation versus failure. A lot of what's keeping us in the efficient but unclear quadrant is we're afraid to choose wrong. We're afraid that we're going to commit to something so that we can start getting to work on it and it's going to turn out to be the wrong thing. We're going to find out at some future date that we chose wrong. And we're going to make that mean we're a failure. This is a decision that is available to you. Get shit done decision making. You have the option to decide if in the future you learn new information, which causes you to have different thoughts and feelings than you do today, that nothing's gone wrong. I'm going to say that again. If you make a decision today, and then in the course of moving ahead through time, you learn new information about what you like, about what happens in the world, about how you feel, about anything. You learn new information, which yields future you having different thoughts and feelings than today you. You have the option to decide nothing has gone wrong. That means if you're afraid today of realizing sometime in the future that you made the wrong choice and you're a failure and you regret everything, those are all optional. You have power over if you decide that's your truth or that's not your truth. What I want you to consider is stagnation versus failure. What's scarier? If failure is a malleable thing that you're actually in charge of deciding if that's meaning you want to assign to anything or not, then what is scarier? Taking action and finding out, ooh, I don't like this, or ooh, this didn't go the way that I thought or wanted, or 
stagnating. That's not to call you out. That's just to give you the option to decide if I'm going to be afraid no matter what, which spoiler alert, human condition, I know it's a bummer, but if I'm going to be afraid no matter what, what's scarier? What do I feel better? Which fear do I feel better embracing and acting through? I know that's a big question. All right, too many priorities. So sometimes we get in this quadrant because we have just too many things that are too important all at the same time. The first decision available to you that I highly recommend if you're going to keep all this stuff on your list is decide it's doable. Remember what I said about we're not going to like go to all this trouble to get the gear and go to the mountain and then start climbing it with the mindset that it's not climbable? That's what this is about. A lot of us can be in this overwhelmed place and it's very vulnerable to think, I don't know how this is all going to get done. What can help people sometimes in these conversations is stepping back and just thinking, do you want to decide it's doable? To get out of this quadrant, think about adopting this attitude that it's all doable. Whatever I want to do is doable. Whatever I decide to try, I'm going to believe it's doable because I refuse to try things that I believe are not doable. You see what I'm saying there? Allow help in. I promise this is not a throwaway bullet point. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I need to like help and delegate and blah, 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 blah. What I want you to look for is what help are you not thinking you need? What help are you not accepting that's being offered to you? And what help have you not needed in the past that you may need now? A lot of us get used to operating in ways that have worked before, and that becomes a very strong reference point for decision-making in the present. But if we're talking about get shit done decision-making, we have to allow today's context to be different than yesterday's context. Think about what help would make things easier going forward and be sure not to take anything off the table before you put it on the table. So some things that get in the way here are assuming this help is unavailable to us. This help is um, impossible. This help is too much to ask for. I want you to just give yourself a tiny bit of space to put everything on the table. All the options, even ones that you think are crazy or impossible or people like you shouldn't need help like this, whatever, just so that you can really see your options. Options equal agency. When you can see that I am an autonomous person who has a lot of options here, you will allow yourself to make an empowered choice, okay? And own your lens. So sometimes we get ourselves in the efficient but unclear quadrant because we are too zoomed out. We are not allowing ourselves to zoom in on what we want to focus on because we feel a responsibility to look at everything all at once. We feel f- afraid to focus on one thing because other things are going to get forgotten. This is something that I see a lot, getting people in this quadrant. This lack of like, permission to zoom in on what's what you want to focus on. Then there's this specific uncertainty. So like, I know kind of what I want to do, but it feels messy and I don't know where to start maybe, or what what's a good goal and what's the, what's the right goal and what's not a good use of my time. This is where deciding your time frame, which we already talked about, is hugely activating. High quality questions. Again, if you have questions, you're in this unclear place, but the questions you've been asking haven't been helping you take any steps forward or learn new information. Permission to ask higher quality questions, answerable questions. And I can help you identify those. The final suggestion here is turning off your right radar and turning on your real radar. This means acknowledging any fear you have of making a wrong decision. We already talked about this, right? The fear of like what you're going to make it mean in the future. If you have different thoughts and feelings, or if you have an experience you don't like and really tuning into what do I genuinely want and feel right now? This is a huge perspective shift. So I don't want to minimize it by squishing it into one little bullet point, making it sound like this should be easy, but it can be fun to recognize where is the inefficiency in this decision making coming from my fear of getting it wrong and my desire to choose right. And if I can ease up on that and really tune into what I genuinely want and care about, you will be surprised at what that opens up for you. And then we have to go into Andy's story because he is a fabulous example of the efficient but unclear quadrant. 
there were so he, I love the way he talks about this. There were so many different shiny objects and ideas. I knew I was clogging the system and making it harder on myself. Like he just always thought of himself as a person who struggled with decisions because he had so much that he cared about and wanted to do and nothing was happening. And he says, it's no accident that within a couple of weeks of starting the first class of our coaching program, he created an LLC. He made a logo. He created a website. He booked a voiceover gig, launched a voiceover career. Things can happen quickly when you make clear decisions. And that, this is what he's saying. The decision-making process has been simplified. So my hope is that all the solutions we talked about in this, quali- this quadrant grease your decision wheels. Take a big sigh of relief because the do not panic quadrant is next, but it's lighter. We're only going to give one suggestion per problem because when you're in this place, things can feel really impossible. And I'm speaking from experience, like ask me how I know. Here's what I see gets people into this quadrant and my suggestion for taking one step out of it closer to center. I don't want you to put the pressure on yourself to switch quadrants. Like I was inefficient. Now I'm perfect. Let's think about inching ourselves forward with gradual change. Remember gradual change, marginal gains. This should say unclear and inefficient. My apologies. So this is the unclear, inefficient quadrant. You're not sure what you want. You're not a lot's getting done. You're not sure how to do it. Sometimes you're here because you're in exploration mode. If you're in exploration mode, like I don't want to commit to anything yet. I'm not ready, but I want to take action. Start with your core values. Top five core values. What's most important for you to align with in your life right now, in this present moment, in this particular season of your life, and what's true to you? What are not the values that your Catholic school or your uh, strict parents or whoever would have you say? but what's really personal and I, and individual to you and let that be your clarity. I worked with someone once who all we did was the core values. That was our only first conversation because she was in this quadrant. She sent me a text the next day that was, it was a fellow stage manager actually. And she said, I just turned down a job because I had crystal clear clarity in making that decision because it didn't align with my values. How helpful is that? And people discount the value of knowing your values because they think it's not the answer to the big shiny question my brain is asking. But again, if that's not a high quality question because you're not answering it, let your values give you a sense of clarity. Start acting in alignment with them on purpose. See what decisions come from that. Need to act fast. If you're in this quadrant, but you actually do need or want to take action like sooner than later. The thing that I see holding people up is what they're making anything mean. Just had a conversation with a client this morning about this because she was thinking about making a decision about changing her career, but she feels unclear and inefficient. It's like a very angsty place, place to be. And one of the things holding her up and keeping her from taking any action was this big meaning she was attaching to a really small action. So this is what I want you to think, just scan for, and I can help you find this stuff, but scan for, am I unable to act right now because my brain's making it mean something that might be optional? Just check. Okay. You're other focused. Sometimes we're in this quadrant and because we, by necessity or choice, are focused on someone or something else. This is when you might be in a caretaking situation. You might be in a big life transition. There's something occupying a lot of your bandwidth. I don't want you to think, I don't have time for myself. I want you to ask, where will I make space for myself? And start small. But this is necessary for you to start proving to yourself that you are in charge of your time And beefing up that sense of agency, even if you're choosing to give a lot of your time and energy to something or someone else, you have to allow yourself any space and any bandwidth to focus on you. Your brain will answer any question that it's asked. So if you ask it, where will I make space for myself? It's going to go to work answering that question. If you're here because you're questioning everything, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. High quality questions, okay? Stop asking the same questions that have gotten you nowhere. Ask new answerable questions. 
And this Megan, I think put it perfectly. My client who said, I feel like before I was waiting for life to happen to me, like for the answers to show up on her doorstep, for her to feel clearer, for her to feel like she was getting shit done. And that's not the case anymore. And she validates. I think the hardest part is figuring out what you want. And then once you realize you can make what you want happen, then you can ask, well, now that I get to choose, what do I want? And I just love that she's sharing that this next year is going to be really exciting for her because she gets to ask over and continually ask, what do I want? And that's fun because she's never spent her life that way before. It's very powerful. So follow through. All of this is great to a point, and then we need to take action on it. Let's get you clear on your next step. I threw a lot at you, but I am here to introduce ideas, and then I will help as much as I can for you to implement the ideas that are going to work for you. Here's what I want you to be able to walk away with. What's the one problem you want to solve first? We explored a lot of options today. My hope is that one or a few of them revealed themselves as the biggest dominoes that are, when you knock those over, it's going to make everything easier to fall. What's the first solution you're going to try? So you've identified the specific problem that you want to focus on. What are you going to do in the next 36 hours? Really valuable questions when we're game planning, what do you anticipate being hard? This comes up a lot when we're like, well, I want to try delegating. And then what do I anticipate being hard? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they're going to do it right. So I'm probably just going to end up doing it myself. That's fine. Be honest so that you can answer the next question, which is what is going to make it easier? And I promise I know this can be daunting, but if you take these questions on one by one and you really allow space and believe they're answerable, you can surprise yourself. I also have suggestions. If you really do feel like, I don't know how to answer these questions, what can make it easier? This is what decision coaching is for. Decision coaching exists, the work that I do, so that you can have expert guidance in seeing things differently, reacting and responding to situations differently, and experiencing things and people differently. It exists as a place for you to prioritize yourself now and clear obstacles out of the way that you either don't want to wait to go away on their own, you don't want to put off any longer, you don't want to rely on other people to do it for you. This is really an arena where we make things possible in your real existing life. We have busy lives that we are doing a lot of stuff in, and it's easy, as I know you know, to feel like we have to put this really important but like hard feeling stuff on the back burner. My job is to help you make space for yourself in your existing life so that you can feel super confident and clear about your choices going forward. Know what you're deciding, know why you're deciding it and be able and feel equipped to stand by it and commit to it and follow through on it. Even if stuff goes not the way you want, even if people have opinions about it work with people in two ways. And I want you to know how you can work with me. If this sounds like anything that you want, the one-on-one support long-term is for habit change. I also work with people on a miniature level when there's one decision that you want to focus on three to six month programs are for the people who want support in daily situations and accountability for making the changes they want and pursuing the goals that they have. We do a lot of habit change work and not to create you into it, perfect person because that's not what we're here to do, but really get you experiencing life the way that you want to. And there are a lot of resources in that kind of work because we talk about a lot of things. Talk about self-compassion. We talk about stress regulation. We talk about communication skills. So that is a beefier program for people who want the lasting habit change and want to really commit to investing some time in themselves. The mini package is for people who know, okay, this freaking rock has been in the road for weeks or months or years, and I want to get it out. So we meet twice over about seven to 10 days. We focus on one decision, solving one problem so that you can end that inertia and get on with your freaking life. Make a decision sessions. You can book directly on my site, kirstenparker.com forward slash coaching. You can go there and just book that because you know, I want help with this decision. This is what I want to focus on. I no longer want to spin about it. I no longer want to put it off. I no longer want to hear what my friends and family and coworkers think I should do about it. That's not getting me anywhere. 
Let's try something different. This is where you come to the expert who has a process they'll guide you through so that you can make a conscious, clear-headed, self-honoring, empowered decision. For longer-term work, we would book a consult so that we can talk through, is this the right fit for you? So what you can expect if you book a consult is we're going to clarify what you want. We're going to get crystal clear on what do you want to change? What do you want to achieve, feel, experience in your life? What's going to be necessary to make those things happen, to turn that into reality? What are your growth areas? The perfectionism stuff, the overthinking stuff, the time organization stuff, the FOPO, the fear of people's opinions. What do we want to work on so that you don't have to spend the rest of your life just being subject to those kind of old ways of thinking and being? And then we determine if the kind of work that I do is the perfect fit for you to create all of that into reality. And either way, whether we work together or not, you leave knowing your next step. That's what I really want you to know that this is a powerful decision. If you're thinking I might benefit from coaching, it's a powerful decision to take what you want seriously. So to take your goals seriously and to take the habit change that you want seriously, because you don't have to live in fear of people's opinions the entire rest of your life. And it doesn't matter if you've spent 40 years operating in that way or overthinking or catastrophizing or whatever habits you have going on. My job is to help you see the next chapters ahead of you in your life as full of possibility and to really help you feel like I can author that story. I can be in charge of what the rest of my life looks like. The final client story I'm going to share with you is from one of my favorite clients, just because her name is Kirsten Parker. She found me because she was trying to buy the domain, Kirsten Parker, and I, she couldn't because it was mine. And then she was like, wait a minute, this is a decision coach. I will never ever get over that, but she's amazing. And she had been struggling with this decision to leave her corporate job. She'd been there 22 years. 22 years. And she'd been thinking about leaving for over a year. And she just knew that that was not working and it wasn't efficient. So she says she couldn't be confident. She knew she was making the right decision. She knew she needed to make decisions more quickly and efficiently and effectively. And she was a high functioning person. She wasn't functioning in the way she wanted and feeling the way she wanted. And after coaching, this is where she landed. I'm much more calm as a person. I feel much more confident, collected. I feel like decisions don't take up 90% of my brain anymore, which delicious. So if you want to explore coaching, go to kirstenparker.com forward slash coaching right now. You can book a make a decision session if you're ready to just like clear an obstacle and get a decision made. We're gonna have so much fun. And if you wanna talk about longer term support because you really wanna put these things into practice, implement the solutions that we talked about and get yourself out of the quadrant that you're in and have longer term guidance and accountability to stay consistent with asking high quality questions, organizing your time differently, learning the skill of delegation, all that stuff. If that's what the longer term coaching would be more appropriate for, and you can book a consult, we can talk about it. Does anybody have anything burning on their minds right now that you want clarifying, you want help with? I'm okay. just, yeah. Hi, hi. Hi. So, you know, when you're saying it really helps to just say to yourself, I have enough time, mm-hmm. like I'll be able to get everything done. Yeah. Um, I, th- this might be the same idea, but it's kind of a different framing. So I want to, but I'm reading the book 4,000 weeks, mm-hmm. which is, and the idea of that book is like, we spend so much time conning ourselves that we're going to be able to get through our long to-do lists. And it's, we're never going to be able to, because life just keeps throwing stuff at us. And like, we're never going to be done. And so I'm, I'm only like, a little bit into the book, but this is the idea. And, um, and once you sort of accept that, like, oh, I'm never going to be done. I'm never going to be able to get everything I want to do done. Then you start focusing on priorities and like the biggest priorities. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you think of that mindset versus the kind of, cause I, I'm guessing that at its core, it's the same, which is you pick your priorities and you become comfortable making trade-offs, but I remember talking to you, one of the things that was like, gave me, made me feel just calmer in life was like, if you're going to make up something about the future, make up something that serves you. And maybe it serves you to think I'm going to be able to get everything done that I want. So I I don't know. What what do you think about the kind of two different philosophies? I, I think this is a great question. And I don't know if they're two different philosophies. I think it's at some point, it's a matter of knowing 
am I kidding myself? Mm -hmm. Am I being unkind? Does it serve, does it serve me or not serve me to believe I can get everything done? And often where the trade-off is, is not in the what it's in the how, how I get it done. Yeah. Like how I get, like, I think when we pit our, our desires and goals and life experiences against each other, it's more about the how than the what, because you can't spend your thirties being an artist, traveling the world and gaining 10 years of experience teaching astrophysics. (laughs) You can't do both of those things for the decade of your thirties, but can you do both of those things in your lifetime? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're you're right in that this idea about what am I projecting as possible? What am I believing is possible or impossible? It's really important to make a conscious decision about does it serve me to think this is all possible or does it serve me to think it's impossible? Does that answer your question? Yeah. And also, I mean, I guess when you were just talking about in sort of just like daily overwhelm, like, you know, I'm looking at my to-do list, right? Like- yeah. Am I, he would say like, just some of these you might never get to, or like some of the things in life you just might never get to, like you might never respond to that email from that person Mm -hmm. or like you might never unpack those like margarita glasses that your sister sent you, or like you might never, but like, that's because you're constantly putting other things ahead and that's okay because you're like, But as long as you're kind of consciously saying, no, I'm choosing to like read a book and not unpack those margarita glasses. And like, I might never get to. And would you say, no, you can do it all. You just need to be flexible about how and when. And like, you know, I guess that's kind of. I I think the mindset is what's most important to me. Like, do you think you can't get to everything because you're just a failure and bad at time? And like, that's just what you have to deal with and settle for because that feels crappy to me yeah it's like empowered conscious choices though then it's okay yeah because that is the the way it's presented like there's just some things you just won't get to sorry feels (laughs) crappy but if it's like no I'm an autonomous human who's in charge of my resources and I'm going to spend them where I choose to spend them and, and this is where we have to remember the latin root of the word decide is to cut off To make a decision cuts you off from the other options, but the benefit of that is that you move forward. Yeah. I think it's it's about the empowerment perspective. Yeah. No, that helps. But with your to-do list, let's talk about this more like on our own, because I think, okay, let's just see if it's the way you're doing it is working. This is like, remember when I said today's context might be different. We might just look at how have you, how are you used to organizing your to-dos and is that still working? Does it need updating? Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Now we'll do that. (laughs) Okay. We'll do that. Anybody else? Oh, wait, uh, Erin, what is, what is one high quality question you would suggest for career next step exploration? Great, 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 great question. So one of the things I think I said on the podcast that came out is today, Thursday, I think it came out today. Um, it sounds like a sneaky question that might make you be like, that's mean, but I promise sometimes it's real yields really useful results. Um, if you did know what you were going to do next, what might you do? That is not to say if you did know the answer to the big question, what would it be? Because that's mean. But if you were going to take action on this career exploration this week, what do you imagine you might do? Usually when I ask that question, people have really vivid images of, well, I would probably send this email that I've been holding off on and I'd call this person and I'd sign up for that class or real tangible things. So that's where I would start. You might not have any answers, which is fine, but it's a really helpful question to see, like to, because you see yourself in your mind's eye taking action. And that's, that's what's most important. Cause if you're in that stuck place, it can be very overwhelming to think about taking action. What I want to help you do is like, see yourself taking action. Does that make sense? It does, because I think what I like about the sneakiness of that question is that it isn't, I feel like sometimes I've used that trick to say, if I did know what it would, but it's still for that amorphous question. Yeah. Well, if you did know what would be your dream job, instead of if you did do stuff this week, what might that look like? I really like that then it's um, breaking it down into smaller actions. 
Yes. Yeah. Love the HQQ. Yes. And I feel s- like that is on my practice to do this. Yes. I swear I spent like three years asking, like, what do I want to do next? What do I want to do next? And I just made it like my personal failing that I didn't have an answer. And it was just because I was asking the wrong question. So that's one that you can start with that. It sounds like you have some like ideas marinating about what you would do. And then values. I know it sounds like totally uncareer related, but the core values It's a something a lot of humans just skip. And it's really nice to feel like, you know, yourself on that level of like, what do I actually value right now? And get past all the shoulds. That's like, I should value family and health and like really tune into your truth right now in this season of your life. Carla's laughing. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I used to facilitate for students on choosing their core values, like several times a week. So like, yes. And then talking about congruency and how you actually live your values. Yes. There's a lot of data in there that can uh, that can guide decision making. And when you're in a place where you don't know the big steps you're going to take, it's incredibly activating and affirming to take small actions on the daily level, which is the only place we can take actions anyway, that you know are in alignment for you. And if you can't answer the big question that your brain is like, I just want this big answer. You can say, I am in alignment with this decision I'm making right now. And that's how you build a lot of trust with your decision-making. Kristen or Carla, do you have any suggestions on resources to look into like kind of, I, I've done value stuff like a, a while ago. So I think this could be a good time to revamp. Yeah. You should just get the clarity workshop because it's $37 on my website and it has like a whole module on core values. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> and I would also, if you were looking for like extra credit rating, I really like the social change model of leadership development because it's very, very values based and it's going to teach you how to like lead through your values. Nice. Unsolicited. I'm sorry. I don't want to take away from the throw in the room, but I'm just, uh, I'm a leadership nerd. So like just putting that out there. This is why I like the boxes with the faces so that we can talk with the voices and and our mouths. If you want to put that in the chat, Carla, that would be super, I would appreciate it too. Um, But the link to the Clarity Workshop is in the chat too. It's super fast. You'll get a whole workbook and it's really like visually satisfying and you get to write things down. It's a little juicy. Thanks, Carla. Hi, welcome back, Tammy. We're still here. (laughs) Okay. um, Wait, why can't I remember how to pronounce your name? Ariane. 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 It's like Marianne without the M. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. I mean, (laughs) I have to do the same thing. Everyone's like Kirsten or Kristen or Kirsten. It's Kirsten, but it's also fine. People at Starbucks call me Houston when they can't figure out what my name is. And I'm like, who is named Houston? That's not even a... Okay, whatever. Um, did that give you enough to start with? Totally. Great. Those okay. are three. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both so much. That's yes. that's great. This might be a bigger question, but based off what, what you're saying, because one of the things I really struggle with is trusting my decisions. Yeah. Um, I don't what are your thoughts on how to like build that muscle towards like trusting making the right decision? And I'll say this is like little things lately, like oh, really yeah. benign little things where you're like, Carla, it doesn't matter what brand of turkey you buy at the store um and like then being able to be like well if I can't trust myself at the grocery store how am I going to trust that I'm making the right career decision yeah this is why I love my job because the little things are the big things I would focus on self-compassion Kristen Neff has a ton of resources on her website it's self-compassion.com org, I think it's like, I I wish it was more intuitive, but you can just Google Kristen Neff. She is the primary researcher on what is self-compassion. How do we take that from a floofy, vague idea and down to like things that we can do and change our real lives. That's a great place to start because we need to get you in communication with the part of you that's afraid of making a wrong choice and afraid of the, the consequences that your subconscious is assigning to being wrong. This is also like I work with people for like weeks and not minutes because this is a lot of work, but I'm laying out the groundwork for you, right? Once you're, you beefed up your self-compassion and you know that this fear is real and it's validated, then you can address the fears and am I okay with deciding every decision I make is right, which is one of the, my fundamentals of my process that I teach. Like there's no such thing as a wrong decision, but that's like a big leap. So I would start working on relating to this part of yourself compassionately. I know that's a huge answer, but no, that's really helpful. Okay. 
If you know that you want to work on it through a decision together, you can just book that directly. If you want to talk about this long-term stuff and if it would be right for you, if this is the right time, all of those questions are welcome. So you can book a consult. This was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. I hope it was useful. Remember, I'm on your team. I'm here to help. I'll see some of you on TikTok. And if you're not on TikTok, get there. (laughs) Okay. Have a beautiful day, everybody. I'll see you soon.